Hey, y'all, y'all having an okay week? I've got good news for you tonight. I've got good news from you. We're going to open up the book of Ephesians. And I was going over this material. We're do, you, this is an expository study on the book of Ephesians. We're going word for word, line for line, chapter by chapter. And, uh, you know, you don't have to be good, just teach the Bible. I mean, the Bible is just so much, so much good news. And, and so let's hit some things. Hey, if you missed the first week or the first two weeks, Every Tuesday, the week before the lesson comes up, so yesterday, lesson two in Ephesians went up, so Ephesians one and two are on our, on our YouTube channel, so you can check that out, and of course, this coming week, this one will be up, but we're just, we're, we're talking, last week we talked about the introduction to the book of, of Ephesians, and they're going to put that up for you, um, that this is the outline that we're using, the greetings, uh, verse one and two of the first chapter, then the wealth of the believer, it goes from chapter 1, verse 3 through 321. The walk of the believer, uh, chapters 4 through 6.9. Then the warfare of the believer, where it talks about putting on the armor of God. Then the conclusion. And so the wealth of the believer, it talks about our, our inheritance in Jesus Christ. And, and, and it's, it's good news, you know. Sometimes we have families. I, I've dealt with families all the time. Uh, who someone dies and people are fighting over material possessions. And here's what I want to say. God's word has the same exact inheritance for all of his children. We all get the same thing, but here's the difference. Some accept it and walk in it, and other ones, uh, you know, choose not to. So very, very important. So then last week we talked about the greetings, and we started the wealth of the believer, the wealth of the believer. And um, so we're talking about the wealth, or you could say the blessings of the believers. And we, we looked at four last week. We're going to look at three more tonight. Then we're going to go to the prayer of the believer. Number one, it says, we learned last week, it says that we were chosen from the foundations of the earth. Before the foundations were laid, we were chosen. God chose us that we were predestined, and we talked about that word. That can open up a can of worms. But, you know, God predestined that everyone have a relationship with him. God made a way so that everyone can have a relationship with him, but he didn't made a, make us robots. We get to choose whether or not we want to live in a relationship with him. Then the third thing is that we were adopted. So we were adopted as sons and daughters. And we talked about that last week. Sometimes... You know, people just have babies, and maybe it was on accident. And then, but here's the deal. When you adopt a child, I, I was adopted from birth. We have many people in our congregation that have adopted children. It is a lot of work to adopt kids. I can even get a bit. Y'all are quiet tonight. Come on. I was just kidding about y'all being an obstinate crowd. I was just, that was a joke, okay? It went like that, okay? And, uh, but, but if you've, you've got to go get lawyers, and it takes money, and it takes time. And, I mean, there's a lot of effort. So if somebody adopts you, it's because they really wanted you. And God really wanted you. He really wanted to have a relationship with you. And so he went out of his way, and he sent Jesus, his son, and paid the highest price so that we could be brought into his family, so that we could be adopted as sons and daughters. Then the fourth thing it says that we are accepted. Now, this is an amazing thing because one of, the, one of the biggest complaints you hear from people that don't go to church or people that don't like Christianity is, you know, Christians, you know, the church, we're a bunch of bigots, we're a bunch of intolerant people. And that, that's nothing from the truth. That should be nothing further from the truth. God was all accepting. He, he accepted us right where we're at. Did he ask us to change? Absolutely. And the church should be you know, just a, an incredible place um, to be accepted. And, and I, I just believe this. Listen, if we can get people to love Jesus, he's going to change them. How many of you, I, I would like a show of hands, how many of you have been successful in changing people? Oh, none of you have changed your kids. None of you have changed your spouses. None of you have changed your boss, you know. Uh, none of you have changed your pastor, huh? I got all those notes under my door. I'm not going for it. But, but it, it, acceptance and love is what breaks down the, the wall. So let's go. We're continuing with the blessings of the believers. Man, these are good news. Number five, 
that we have been redeemed. We have been redeemed, Ephesians 1, 7, in him. So in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. This word redemption, some of these words, you know, re redemption and forgiveness, you're, you're thinking, well, they're the, they're the same word. No, they're different words, but they're kind of close in meaning. And I'll try to do a, a, a reasonable job of explaining the difference. But redemption means to be ransomed in full. It's a riddance or a deliverance. And really the connotation is like emancipation of slaves. That we were slaves. We were in bondage, you know. Just like the children of Israel, they were in bondage in Egypt. And that is symbolic of of humanity, our bondage to slave in sin. So redemption is emancipation of slaves, the releasing of those bound up, setting free those under bondage. Um, you know, and notice it's in him. It's through the blood of Christ. Listen, there is no counseling session that can set you free. There is no therapist that can set you free. There is, there is no 12-step program that can set you free. It's Jesus Christ and his blood that sets us free. And, and we, we've got every, every, listen, everything is about the blood. You know, a lot of times the church has gotten away from the sacrifice of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, but it was his blood and purity given for us that allowed us to be redeemed. And so if you're redeemed, just shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Oh, everyone wanted in on that, huh? <laughs> so this verse clarifies the re that redemption comes through the blood of Jesus. And we're talking about the significance of the blood. And so here's the thing. It was, it was the very cost. The blood of Jesus, think of this, was the very cost. It was the very price. It was the currency paid for our, for our redemption. There, there was no other way. It was the... It was the it was, I, this is foreign to us, but way back in these times, all over the world, there were slave auctions. And, you know, we, we think we're, you know, uh, you know, civilized now. At this time, there were slave auctions everywhere, and you would go in and you would bid on which slave you wanted to own or to purchase. And, and imagine this, it's powerful. It's like God walking into the slave auction and saying, hey, you know what? I purchase all of them with the blood of my son. The very highest price. There's no currency higher or stronger than the blood of, the blood of Jesus. So it, the blood of Jesus was our ransom price. And, and see, I think the reason, the reason that we're having a problem in Christianity today, the reason we're having problems in churches, because we don't, we don't understand the cost that was paid for us. And we don't appreciate it. You know, that's why, that's why Paul's all the time saying, I encourage you, I challenge you, his churches, to live in a manner worthy of Jesus Christ. He gave you his very best. Don't you dare give him a tip. Don't you dare give him leftovers. He gave his best, and he demands our best from us. Now, look, sometimes our best isn't very good. But we're trying. Come on, church, have you been there before? I'm not trying to beat you down, and that's what God's grace is for. But he, doesn't, he, he wants us to put out effort. He wants us, you know, to, to uh, pursue spiritual growth. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says this, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb, without blemish or defect. So we, we you know, let, let, let's go through the list again. We've been chosen. We've been predestined. We've been adopted as sons. We've been accepted. And we've been redeemed. Uh, number six is we have forgiveness of sins. We have forgiveness of sins. And Hebrews 9.22 says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Or without the, the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so think about all those years the Israelites were traveling. You know, Jesus had not come yet. So they had to make atonement. So they would get a lamb without blemish. You know, you couldn't just take a sick lamb. What's well, going to die anyway? Let me go sacrifice it to Jesus. No, what, no it was you had, to, 
you had to sacrifice your very best. But it only, in the high priest, on the Day of Atonement every year, would sacrifice for the sins of all the people. But it was only good for one year. It was a temporary atonement. And, of course, Hebrews tells us when Jesus came and he gave his blood for us, it was a forever atonement. No more, nothing else will ever need to be done except accept the blood of Jesus. So let's look at forgiveness. So we have redemption. What's the difference between redemption and forgiveness? And again, again, they're close, but let's look at it. Forgiveness is, is to freedom, uh, freedom, pardon, remission, or liberty. L- literally in the Greek, it's to loose someone from that which binds them. To forgive means to unchain someone. Unforgiveness binds, binds both you know, both people up. So the the thought is this, is that redemption, you're redeemed from your old way of life, from the old man. The the, the picture is God went into the slave market and he took you back from the devil. But forgiveness, now we're we're talking about uh, forgiveness for our personal sins and dealing with our our, our sin nature. So let's talk about, let's talk about uh, two types of sin right now. In this passage, it's, it's talk, it says sin and sin. So sin singular and sin plural. So they'll put this up on the screen. Sin, the Greek word for sin is hamataria. And it's, it's, it's our old sin nature, uh, our flesh, our old man. It, it's when, you know, when, when we're perpetually driven to miss the mark like an, an archer. He's shooting at, an air, at a target and he, and he misses it. So that, that's our sin nature. Uh, is we were born with this sin nature, and, you know, the Bible tells us we need to crucify our sinful nature. The problem is that our sinful nature, it always seeks a resurrection. I mean, if you, if you don't, what, if, if you go home to your yard, if you don't do anything to your yard, what grows? Weeds. It's amazing. It's amazing. But, like, you have to fertilize and do all this stuff, uh, you know, to have, to have healthy grass. So, that's sin. Sins in the Greek is a different word, parapetoma, and it means individual sins, errors, unintentional sins, a lap or a deviation in judgment. So the idea is that we were redeemed from our hamataria or our sin nature, and we were forgiven from our individual sins or parapetoma. And so that's the difference there. And then at number seven, it says the blessings, it says that. God has revealed mysteries. God has revealed mysteries. Ephesians 1, verse 9 through 10, it says this, He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So he made known his, his mystery. You know, in the word there, together, together in the Greek, it means add, like adding up a list of figures, a sum total, uh, all adding up to uh, Jesus Christ. So, so basically, all these mysteries are going to be made known uh, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment. And it goes on to say that at the end of, the, at the end of time, Christ is going to bring all things together uh, under him. And so verse 9 and 10, they, they really, they go together. There, there will be a continued unfolding revelation of the mysteries of Christ with, with a culmination at the end of time. And, and so here, here's, here's the thing, church. As we grow spiritually, the stronger we get, the better we know God's word, the better, the stronger our prayer life becomes. God begins to show us things that we did not know before. The, these revelations, these, these mysteries. And I'm not trying to be weird. I'm not trying to be, you know, super, super spiritual or anything like that. But um, there's a lot of mysteries in life. And there's a lot of mysteries in the spiritual realm too. Have you ever read the Bible and you're like, well, how can that be? Or how does that happen? And, and what I think is as, as, we, as we grow through life, obviously one day when we get to heaven, and we're going to receive the mind of Christ. We're going to receive imperishable bodies. And, you know, we're going to know. We're going to understand things. People always tell me, well, when I get to heaven, the first thing I'm going to ask is, you're not going to ask anything. 
because it's going to be made known to you. But I also believe as we follow God here on the, on, on the earth, there are some revelations of mystery that, that, he, he, that he wants to show us. For example, uh, you know, a lot of times we're trying to reach people for Christ. And, and I, believe, uh, I believe everyone has, has, every individual is uniquely a, mirror, a, a mystery. You know, if so, you could use one, if you found one tactic that brought one person to the Lord, you could just use that on everybody. But everyone has different walks of life. Everyone has different families of origin. Everyone has different baggage they're carrying. And so anyway, my, my point is, is that one of the blessings is as we go through life, there are, there are from the spiritual realm, there are, re, there are mysteries of revelation that God can show us. And these mysteries, they may be how to, how to help somebody. They may be how to start a business. They may be how to reach people for Christ or whatever. Maybe, you know. Come on, man, it was just Valentine's Day. Sometimes our wives are a mystery, right? You need a revelation for that mystery. I got an I got a amen right there on the front row. I'll see you in the doghouse later on. <laughs> Let's go to Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. So we're just going through these chapters, and this is, this is, this is an incredible passage. In him... We were also chosen. So again, it starts to repeat again. In the first part of Ephesians 1, it was talking about these blessings, our inheritance, the wealth of the believer. And then they start to repeat. And in him we have also were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in him, in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, uh, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So look in verse 11 through 14 that we just read. Let's leave that up there. Um, Notice... That there, n- notice the use of personal pronouns here and how they begin to switch. First, he's using we, we, ours. Then he, then he goes to you, you and, and, and ours. And Paul is drawing a very vivid contrast between the Jews and the Greeks. And, you know, verse 11, 12, we, the Jews, who were the first to hope in Christ, you know, the Messiah, the Messi- Messianic prophecies, It says, and then in verse 13, it says, and you also were included when what? You believed. You heard the word and you believed. It says, when you believed, you you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing what? Our. So he starts off with we, the Jews. Then he goes to you, the Gentiles. You were also brought in when you believed. And now the Holy Spirit is what? Is his ire. All of us. He is our deposit. So Paul says three things about the Gentiles here. First of all, they heard the word of truth. Secondly, they believed the word of truth. And third, that they were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And I know that this word sealed, I know that many of you have probably watched uh, movies way back in time and, and all the kings and all the important people, all the nobility, when they would send an edict, when they would send a letter, they would put wax on it and they had the king's seal and they would seal it. And so when the person receiving the letter, they knew whether it had been opened again, open or not. You know, it's not like some of these envelopes today where you could put some heat and some steam. And then, I mean, it was like, it was like the real deal, right? And, and, and so again, it, it signified uh, ownership, where it was from, where, who it was being sent to, and it, it ensured it. And so it says in the same way, the Holy Spirit has marked us, has ensured us that he is our deposit. It says, verse 14 says, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. So the King James Version says that the Holy Spirit is the earnest money of our inheritance. So uh, deposit, deposit is earnest. And in, in the Greek, it's the word arabon, arabon. It's a business word, a commercial term. And it has to do with making a purchase. It's a down payment 
for things to come. Now, if you've ever bought a home, what, ha- what the deal is, you go look at the home, you put an offer on the home. But a lot of stuff has to happen between the initial offer and, and the closing day. So you, the, the, the buyer puts down earnest money. And, and, and what they're saying is, I, you know, I'm committed to doing this and I'm going to put down a good bit of money for the earnest money. It shows the buyers that you're serious. And, uh, it, you know, then, of course, there's, you have like a seven-day win- window to do home inspection, things like that. And to, you can get your earnest money back if it's a problem, but if not, you, you lose it. So the Holy Spirit is our, our bond, our deposit guaranteeing our, her- our, our inheritance until the final redemption. Now, I, some of you may be saying, well, what do you mean the final redemption? Well, you just talked about how one of the blessings is that we have redemption, that, that God has gone and bought us with the blood of Jesus out of, out of the, the, you know, the, the, the slave auction. And here's the thing. You have been redeemed. We have been redeemed in part. Full redemption comes when we go to heaven and we receive our resurrected bodies, our imperishable bodies. And so he said, we Jews, you Gentiles, and it's ours together. So those are the um, those are the, the seven blessings or inheritance things in the first chapter, and the first chapter it closes with with a prayer from the apostle Paul. And the apostle Paul, in all of his epistles, he had incredible prayers. But I'm telling you, the prayer in this prayer in Ephesians is is probably the most powerful prayer of all of his epistles. I mean, it's just an incredible prayer. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people say, you know, pastor, I don't know how to pray. I can't learn how to pray. And I always tell them, go and read the prayers of the Bible and just follow, follow that. And so let me take you with that here the next 15 minutes. So we're going to read uh, eight verses. So this is what we're calling the prayer of the believer, believer, part B, prayer of the believers, Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. And it says this, for this reason... Ever, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, look, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule, all authority, power, and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So in verse 15 through 23, you know, again, it's one of the most powerful prayers there. So let's start with the introduction of the prayer, verse 15 and 16. And I uh, I think in these two verses, Paul shows us two characteristics of a turned on church, two characteristics of a church that gets God's recognition, Paul's recognition, you know, and imagine Paul is sitting there in prison, he's writing his epistle, and he says this, you know, that I hear ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. So Paul says, number one, thing about a fired up church is, is it's a faith church. They have faith. And again, I think the problem with many Christians is that their, their faith has expired. We, every time we come to church, every time we read our Bible, every time we go to Bible study, every, I mean, we, we, we should have faith that God's going to do something. We should have faith that God can do things, that he can change situations. So he's like, you know, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about your faith, your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and also the faith of what God can do in your life. You know, again, I w- this past week I was, I was um, let me see how to say this. 
Yeah, I was just, I was talking to a, this isn't going to be entirely accurate, but for the, because we're recording this, I'm, this, give me this liberty. So I, I was, you know, dealing with a church in this area, you know, and, and, you know, right down the road, a local church, and, and, and I was just, anyway, I was reading their doctrinal statements, and, you know, gosh, they don't, they don't, they don't believe in miracles, you know, they don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. They don't, they don't believe in this. And I'm like, well, gosh, sign me up to go to that church. You know when you really start believing in miracles? When you need one. That's when. And when you see God come through for you, then you're like, man, he came through for me. He'll come through for you. But, you know, in other words, uh, you know, a church without faith, we have, to have, we have to have faith that every time we show up, God's going to do something here, that someone's life is going is, is to be, be changed. You know, I've been, I was talking a couple Sundays ago to a, a, a family started coming to church, and, and the husband never wanted to come to church. And, and um, you know, anyway, he came up to me, and he's like, man, I can take it here. Well, okay. I'm not sure what that means, but he can take me. Some can't. <laughs> he can take me, right? And um, then he came up to me a couple weeks ago. I, he was about to cry, and he's like, every Sunday I almost come up. Every Sunday I almost come up to give my life to the Lord. And, and you know, I'm, I'm like, maybe next Sunday is going to be your day. He's going to come up. We have to have faith that even people that don't want to go to church, when they come, that God is going to touch them, that God is going to restore them, that God is going to change them. So a faith church and a loving church. And, and church, again, I'm just, we got to love people in the kingdom. We just have to love people. We have to love people despite their personalities or a lack of. We have to love people. Whether they, they want to be loved or not, I'm telling you, Jesus said, by this all people know you're my disciples. If what? If you love one another. Not if, not, not if you're the best looking, not if you're the most spiritual, but love will break down everything. We've been talking about 1 Corinthians 4 through 8 in our, in our relationship series. You know, and all the ingredients of love. And it says that love never fails, that prophecy will fail. That tongues will be stilled, but love is, is, is above all. So faith and love, I cannot think of two better qualities to have in a church. And then Paul, this is interesting, Paul says, I give thanks to you without ceasing. And, and the reference is there, to make mention of you by name. When I was a youth pastor one time, we're going around and, and um, we're having a we're having a talk, and with the, the boys are always honest. You, never, you don't always want to know what they're going to say, but they're always honest. And I said, hey, what, what, the conversation came out, what makes you feel bad? And this young, this 17-year-old boy said, you know what makes me feel bad? When we have certain missionaries that come to church every year, they come about the same time, and he always tells the congregation, hey, would y'all just pray for me every day while I'm gone? And everyone says they will. Then you, then you see him come the next year, and you're like, oh, I hadn't prayed for that guy at all, you know? He's like, that, he's, that makes me feel like, he said, it makes me feel like a loser. And, but Paul said, you know, think how much time, you know why Paul spent so much time in prayer? Because he had all these churches everywhere that he's trying to keep on the, and they all had issues, and he's just pray. well, I can't be there, I, do, I can just pray for him. And so, there, listen, there's something specific we can pray for people in general, but start mentioning people's names. You know, I have a list of all the congregation on there. And I pray for every single person every day. I'm kidding, I don't. That's too many people. We got like 500 people, right? But I go down the listing where I stop one day, I go back. And so what I want you to see, all of your, all, around this congregation, everyone's in the letters, a different name of the alphabet, and it's in alphabetical order. So someone here is getting prayed for every day, and we have our staff praying for people. And, but, but there's something specific if I say, hey, Lord, I just want you to bless Daniel and Olivia. I just want you to bless. God, just, he's at work today. He's in people's homes. Give, give, help him encourage somebody. God, I just pray for Olivia's health. Lord, you know, just to mention people by name. Listen, we ought, we ought to do that. We ought to pray for our friends and just have a rotation of people that we're praying for and, ble and lifting them up uh, before the Lord. Then when you see someone, you look at them and say, I was praying for you this week. 
I sometimes see people like, were they on the list this week? Did I make it to them this week? But anyway, I pray for you. So now let's, let's, let's look at this, this prayer. The best way to organize this prayer is to talk about the five main topics that Paul prays for. So what I'm saying is if you don't know how to pray, take these five points I'm fixing to give you and just pray for these things to be done in your life. It's, there's many other prayers in the Bible. As, as a matter of fact, all of Paul's epistles have a prayer in it. And so very good place to start. So first of all, he says, I pray that you have the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Those are two things, wisdom and revelation. Um, wisdom, wisdom is the Greek word, of course, Sophia. We probably, most people know that. And, and it's knowledge that sees into the heart, into the heart of things, um, it's knowledge that sees in the heart of things, knowledge that has a deep sensitivity, a deep insight. It's not superficial. It's not surface. It sees into the heart of things and knows them as they really are. You know, church, there's something different. I want to encourage you on this. There's something, there's something very different. See, we, we have a lot of people in church that, that think they're intelligent and they're trying to figure out things through their intelligence. Or I got a program for that. Or I got, yeah, I got some of that. But he, the, the thought is this, is the reason we're praying and the reason we have problems is because we haven't been able to figure out how to, get, how to handle them and how to get over them. And so we're praying for God. I know that you're, the, Lord, one of your characteristics are that you're omniscient, that you know everything. God, I pray for the spirit of wisdom on my life. Give me wisdom dealing with this people. Give me wisdom how to be a better parent. Give me wisdom how to connect with my child. Give me wisdom how to be a better husband. Give me wisdom at work. God, when I talk to people, give me wisdom so that, that I can get right to the heart of the matter. And, and I think a lot of times we're, you know, we're praying for God to get us out of a jam, but we're not praying for God to give us wisdom. And if we have God's wisdom, if Sophia is coming down and manifesting in our lives, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get us out of a whole lot of problems we will never even get into. So first of all, I pray for the spirit of wisdom. Number two, the spirit of revelation. The, a revelation, the Greek word is apocalypsis. And it means to reveal, to disclose, to have insight. So the idea of revelation, knowledge, and discernment that leads uh, to right actions. You're reading God's word and you have the discernment insight that leads you to proper application. A scholar by the name of E.W. King, and he was talking about knowledge and he says this. I know a lot of people who claim to know the word of God, but the only way I can know for sure is to see whether or not they act on it. So, so to know means more than just head knowledge it is to discern rightly and then act it out and um, you know, so someone, a lot of people claim a lot of things in church. I have a revelation of real love. Well, I'll be the judge of that. I'll see how you treat people. I'm going to follow you around and wait till you have a bad day. I'm kidding. Or I have a revelation of healing and health. Well, okay. It, it's, it's not just what you say. Um, I had one of my friends, he, he, he said, hey, man, Terry, I was going to this church for so long and I just, I just have to leave and and, you know, I love the pastor. I'm not mad, but I have to leave. I'm like, why do you have to leave? He's like, well, he's always, talking about, he's always talking about prosperity and health. And he's the poorest, sickest person I know. I'm so, that's funny. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's funny. What, what, what's he saying? It's like, you know, I, I would like to see that lived out in my pastor's life or he's talking about it. Anyway. So the whole purpose of wisdom and revelation, look, is to know him better, is to know him better. It's the Greek word. We do this in our membership class. Many of you are going to take it this week. The word there to know is epignosis. Now, the word head knowledge is gnosis. The G is silent, gnosis. But epignosis, and it's like this. The, the whole purpose, we want wisdom and revelation so that we know God better. And uh, our goal here at Family Life is to help people have a relationship with Jesus. And a lot of people spiritually, when you hear someone saying like, yeah, the man upstairs, they, they, they don't know God. 
They may believe in him, but he's not the man upstairs. He's the creator of heaven and earth. But here's the thing. We all know, see, we think that we know some people that we don't. Like, we think we know people on TV. We don't know them. Some of them act real pious in their dogs, you know. One day, I was leaving my home. And uh, I lived in the Congo at the time. I was leaving my home. And I drove one block and I went to turn left. And there were police cars. And there were fire, stations, fire trucks and everything. And I'm like, oh my gosh, man, what happened? And you know what happened? Th this is what goes on in the homes all around us we don't even know. A man and woman were getting divorced. It was a very contentious divorce. And uh, she had a restraining order against him because, I don't know, he had threatened violence. So this la the lady that was going through the divorce, she was seeing another man. And so the, guy, the, hu the original husband had a restraining order. He found them in a hotel, and he shot them both. And, and I'm thinking, dear Lord, we have orphan kids right now because... This crazy, so, so my whole thing is I had seen them, drove by, wave at them. I didn't know their situation. I didn't know what they're going through. And so the thought is we want wisdom and revelation so we can know God in an intimate way. We can know God, uh, not just head knowledge, but heart knowledge. Ephesians 1.18 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Enlightened. And that word enlightened in the Greek is photizio. Photizio, and it's to illuminate, to brighten up, to make see. How many of you knew that you had eyes in your heart? We did. We have, you have eyes. You learned something you didn't know. You have eyes in your heart, spiritual eyes. So the spirit man has eyes to allow you to see in the spiritual realm. And so he says, I pray that the eyes of the spirit man will be illuminated, will be brightened up so that you'll be able to see what is going on around you. So the next three, the next three parts of prayer, they're really, they're realizations. And he prays for realizations. Number three, the realization of hope. The realization of hope. He says, um, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The second realization, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. So let's look at these three revelations. For the first one is the revelation of hope. And so hope, hope is the ex expectation of future blessings, right? No one here hopes for bad things. What, what are we hoping? That God continues to bless us. We're hoping that our family stays healthy. We're hoping that people are praying for to receive the Lord. Uh, you know, I have, I have a lot of hopes. I have all of our mission and projects around the world. I'm hoping, you know, uh, that India continues to reproduce and plant churches. You know, we're praying for more things for, Viet, for Vietnam and, and, and Rice for Christ. And by the way, I know they've been gone for 10 months, but right, Terry and Ty, would you raise your hands? That, that's our missionaries to Vietnam right there. And I forgot, I forgot to uh, announce them on Sunday morning, but on Sundays, my, my head is like a ping pong ball, stuff going on in there. So all kind of things going. But it's like, you know, if you, if you set the ther your thermostat on 70, your hope and your expectation is what? That it gets to 70. If it doesn't get to 70, you can call somebody, right? Why is you going to call your husband? Get, the, get him out here. Get the repairman out here. It's July. It's hot, right? Hebrews 11 one says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So hope is the expectation or the confidence of future blessings. If you have no hope, there's no, there's no blessings in the future Number four, the realization of the riches of his inheritance. And two things here that when we break down the riches of his inheritance, riches in the Greek it refers to wealth, money, possessions, or valuable bestowment. Inheritance is, is heirship. It, it's, it's inheriting what Jesus has, the heirship of Jesus Christ. So again, when your spiritual eyes start to get open, you start reading the word of God and you start to realize how great 
our inheritance is in Jesus. We've been listing all of them. Salvation, deliverance, healing, prosperity, acceptance, uh, adoption of sons, predestined. And the last thing, and the musicians can come up and we'll do a little bit of worship and have a prayer time. The fifth thing is this. He says, pray for the realization of God's power in your life. And, and this is very, Ephesians 1, 19 through 21, this is very powerful. And his incomparably great power. What's that saying? That, that th there's no power that God has. Nothing can even compare to it. For us who believe that same that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realm. Have you ever read about when Jesus resurrected? Right? Things were shaken. The dead people walking into the city just came back to life. Unbelievable. So in incomparably exceeding. Uh, that means to throw beyond the mark to surpass. Well, I'm expecting that God can do this, but really it goes out here. It, it's way beyond the mark. It's beyond what you can hope or imagine. Great, the ma uh, great power, the, the magnitude of his greatness. And of course, that word, that word power is the word dunamis, which we get uh, miraculous power, uh, violent power, dynamite power. And then it says this. So there's all this stuff, God's incomparably great power. Who's that given to and who's that for? For those who believe. For those who believe. We talked about this several weeks ago. The word believe is the word pistuo. And it's the same word used in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. If you believe that Jesus Christ, and if you believe in your heart and profess with your mouth, you will, you will be saved. So we did two things tonight. You can stand with me. We, we, finished, we finished the blessings of the believer in chapter one, and the, seven of them in all. And then, then I just, I really, I gave you an outline that if you want to increase your prayer life, you want to improve your prayer life, I, you know, all we have to do is just, just find a great prayer. And until you learn how to do it yourself, just, just begin to pray. So we pray for wisdom and revelation. We pray for hope and and we pray uh, for his power in our life. And we pray, you know, just, just all of these things. So let, let's close in prayer. And, and um, we, have, we have a few minutes, so we'll just worship a little bit more. Would you raise your hands with me? God, I just pray tonight for, these, for your people that came out. Lord, I know they, they took time out of their day to come here. So I pray, Lord God, that... that I was effective in teaching your word, Lord. I pray that some principles uh, were, were, were put into their life, God. And Lord, I, I just pray, Lord, right now, we, we just, Lord, I really believe that when we understand how much you've given us and how much you love us, it changes how we live for you. Lord, when we realize that you chose us, you predestined us before the creation of the world, you've accepted us, you've adopted us, You've redeemed us. You have forgiven us. These are just powerful things, Lord God. So I pray for everyone tonight just to be encouraged. Amen. Let's worship for a moment. I'll come up and dismiss us.